Welcome to the wonderful world of physics. This is chapter 18 on heat, work, and the first law of thermodynamics. My treatment of this chapter is going to be briefer than most chapters, and so I'm going to try to do the entire chapter in one video. And I'm just covering sections 1 and 2 in chapter 18. So let's get into it. The question I want to start with is how can we raise an object's temperature? We have an object, we want its temperature to go up. How can we raise its temperature? And probably the more obvious answer to the question is to add heat. Normally in life, if we want to raise something's temperature, we put it on a stove, we put a flame under it, we add heat. But another thing we can do is to do work, to do mechanical work. And there's something about the joules of work that we do, that's energy that we invest, and that can raise the temperature. So it's questions like this that uh, lead into what we're going to talk about in chapter 18. But the important concept here is that doing work can increase the internal energy of the object. This brings us to the first law of thermodynamics. It's a pretty simple equation, but it will govern much of what we do in this chapter and in our exploration of thermodynamics, and it's this, delta U equals Q plus W. Delta U is the change in a system's internal energy. So sometimes in the book, instead of U, you'll see it as internal energy, or E with a subscript INT. Other textbooks, and the way I write it is just with a capital U, but that is the internal energy. Now, uh, that internal energy is related to the temperature. Remember that temperature, as we saw in a previous chapter, temperature is the average kinetic energy of the random motion of the molecules. So it's related to this. So when internal energy goes up, then the temperature is going up as well. And it's equal to, there are two components. First is Q, the heat that we add into it. Second is W, the work done to the system, or the work done on the system, which means by adding heat, that can raise the temperature. Also, by doing work to the system, to the, maybe it's a collection of gas molecules, we do mechanical work on it, that adds to the internal energy, which will increase the temperature. Now, any of these terms could be negative as well, so if Q is negative, if we extract heat, that could lead to a decrease in temperature. Also, if we do negative work on the system, which means the system does work on its environment, and a prominent example that we'll see in this chapter is that when a canister of gas or a collection of gas, when it gets compressed, its environment is pushing on it, the environment is doing work on it, that will increase the internal energy. However, the opposite can be true. If the gas expands, then it is doing work on its environment. It's pushing the environment away, out of the way to make room for it. Well, if the gas or the system, as I'll call it, is doing work on its environment, then W will be negative because W is defined as the work done on the system. By the way, if you're looking at other textbooks and other sources, maybe on the internet, you may come across this equation written as delta U equals Q minus W. And the difference is it just has to do with how you define W. If you see an equation, uh, the first law of thermodynamics written as minus W, all that means is they're defining W as the work done by the system. And I think that that can become unclear. That's the way I learned it when I was in college. But I think it, um, it can be confusing and less clear. So I prefer it the way our book does it and the way you see it on the screen. Delta U is Q plus W. And this is basically a statement of conservation of energy. Whatever heat you add plus whatever mechanical work, that becomes energy, uh, that becomes an increase in the internal energy of the system. Now back in chapter 16, you learned that uh, in raising the temperature of an object, Q equals mc delta T, so the heat we put in is mass times specific heat times change in temperature. And so now I'm going to update that equation a bit. Yes, Q equals mc delta T, but 
we can also do work. So now Q plus W equals MC delta T because W can also, uh, or the work done, I should say, can also add to a change in temperature. An example could be you, you have a canister of gas and you put it on the stove, that's adding heat, but you also do something to agitate the gas, to agitate those gas molecules. Maybe you compress it, you're doing work on it, that will add to an increased temperature. Let's look at problem number 12 in the book. It says in a closed but uninsulated container, 500 grams of water are shaken violently until the temperature rises by three Celsius degrees. The mechanical work done in the process is nine kilojoules. How much heat is transferred to the surroundings during the shaking? How much mechanical energy would have been required if the container had been perfectly insulated? All right, so you see the information that I've written down. There's the mass, the work done to the system. And in this case, the system is the 500 grams of water. It's 9,000 joules. Change in temperature is plus three Celsius degrees. And we want to know what is the heat. Now, question A asked how much heat is transferred to the surroundings. Q is defined as how much heat goes in. So Q, if there is heat transferred to the surroundings, that means that heat is going out. So I expect that Q is going to be a negative number. And we want to know what is that absolute value. All right, so let's do it. Q plus W, which by the way, is the change in internal energy. That's the first law of thermodynamics right there, is MC delta T. We wanna solve for Q. So Q equals MC delta T minus W. So we'll put in the M, the C for water, the T. We always need to be careful when we're evaluating W. Is it positive or is it negative? Well, there's the minus sign there, but I mean, is W 9,000 or is it negative 9,000? So we have to think W is defined as work being done to the system. And it says that 9,000 joules that we are doing the work to the water, to the system, 9,000 joules, so it's positive. So when we calculate that, Q is negative 2724 joules. That means that heat leaves the water. 2724 joules leave the water. And it's allowed to leave because it says it's an uninsulated container. So I'll round it off to significant figures. So we can say 2,700 joules are transferred out of the water. Now, the next question says, what if it were an, a perfectly insulated container, meaning no heat is allowed to leave? Q equals zero. How much mechanical energy would have been required if the container had been perfectly insulated, meaning would have been required to raise it by three Celsius degrees. So Q equals zero, which means Q plus W becomes W equals MC delta T. The work required to raise 500 grams of water by three Celsius degrees is 6,300 joules. So if it were insulated, it would have taken 6,300 joules, but a lot of our work gets wasted. The heat goes out in the uninsulated cup, 2,700 joules get wasted, they go out into the environment. So in the uninsulated cup, we ended up doing 9,000 joules of work. The first law of thermodynamics is delta U equals Q plus W. But we can give a slightly different version of this. We can talk about the rate of change. So now we're talking about power measured in watts, the rate of energy flow. And that equation, with taking the time derivative, instead of delta U, we can say is du dt. So that's the rate of change of the internal energy. Equals dq dt. So that's the rate of change measured in watts of how the, the heat flow into the object plus dw dt, and that's gonna be the rate that work is done, and all those are measured in watts. So it's the first law of thermodynamics, but dividing by time. Problem number 14 is a good quick example of that. It says, find the rate of heat flow into a system whose internal energy is increasing at the rate of 45 watts, given that the system is doing work at the rate of 165 watts. 
So you look at the information I've written down. It says given that, or it says whose internal energy is increasing at the rate of 45 watts. So here we have the du dt component, 45 watts. And then it says the system is doing work at the rate of 165 watts. So this is the dw dt, but the system is doing work. And remember, W is defined as work done to the system. So it's negative. It's going to be negative 165 watts. And the question is asking, find the rate of heat flow into the system. And so we'll use DQ dt equals DU dt. Minus DW dt. And I get that from, if you look near the top of the screen, there's the original equation, but I'm solving it for dq dt, so right down here. So 45 watts minus negative 165 watts, and we get a rate of heat flow into the system of 210 watts. This is section two on thermodynamic processes. Consider a simple system. This is the kind of system we'll ponder often. Um, it's an ideal gas confined in a cylinder and sealed with a movable piston. So there I've drawn it. There's the gas inside. The piston moves up and down. Uh, we could also draw a handle on it. I haven't drawn a handle, but we can. Uh, so there's something that we can maybe manipulate. We can push it in, we can pull it out. Let's talk about work and volume changes. The work done on the gas, that's how we've defined W, we can derive it this way. You look at my picture and imagine that the gas is expanding. It's pushing that piston up, pushing against the environment. So it is applying a pressure. That's the force it's pushing with, pressure times area the force of the gas, and let's say it moves up a certain distance, delta x. So we have force of the gas is pressure times area. The gas is doing work on the piston. So we can see the increment of work done by the gas. So that, don't think of this as the change in work, but more uh, the, the small increment of work done by the gas is the force of the gas times displacement. That goes back to first semester work in one dimension is force times displacement. Force of the gas is pressure times area. Then we have times displacement. And I'm replacing here the area, the cross-sectional area, times delta x. That's the change in volume. So what we get is the work done by the gas on that piston is pressure times change in volume. Work done is pressure times change in volume. Now, that's the work done by the gas. The work done on the gas by Newton's third law is going to be equal and opposite. So that's going to be the negative of the force of the gas times delta x. And so what it comes down to is that our W for the first law of thermodynamics is negative pressure times change in volume. Now, if we're talking about little changes in distance, little changes in volume, we can say then that work is going to be the sum of all those little changes, the sum of all the dw's, which means work is the integral, and don't forget the negative sign, it's the negative integral of PdV. So we're integrating over volume, which means our, lim our limits of integration will be V1 and V2. So this equation right here where my pointer is at is a very important equation. Now, work done on the gas, that's how we define W, is going to be positive if it's compressed. So if V2 is less than V1, if it ends up smaller than it was, that means the environment has pushed it, has squished it uh, to a smaller space, the environment has done work on it. So work done on the gas is positive if it's compressed. If it expands, meaning V2 is greater than V1, then that means that the work done on the gas is negative. In fact, the gas has done positive work on its environment. 
and uh, the middle in between these is work is zero when the gas does not change volume. So there's our main equation in the box right there. Work is the negative integral from V1 to V2 of P dV. And now I'm going to introduce you to a very useful tool in thermodynamics called a PV diagram. A PV diagram is a graph of pressure versus volume. Volume always on the horizontal axis, pressure on the vertical axis. And then let's say we have this gas and it goes through this change where you can see uh, over a small amount of time it's increased in pressure, it's also increased in volume. So it's got its initial pressure and volume, it's got its final pressure and volume, and the work done actually is the integral of that function. It's the area under the curve. So I've shaded that in gray. The area under that curve is in joules is the amount of work done. And so here we can see it's expanding goes from V1 to V2. I've drawn the arrow going from left to right. And so uh, work is going to be less than zero. Work is negative. I want to look at different types of thermodynamic processes and see how we can evaluate them. And the first one is what's called an isothermal process. Isothermal means constant temperature. It comes from the Greek uh, iso means equal and then thermal that relates to temperature. So constant temperature. Let's start with PV equals nRT, the ideal gas law. And the technique I've shown you before in solving many problems like this is we put the changing quantities to the left, the constant quantities to the right. And that's easy because in this case, it's already there in that form for us. PV equals constant. So if PV equals constant, thinking back to algebra one class, when we had XY graphs, XY equals constant looked like a hyperbola, like you see in this graph right here. So PV equals some constant, nRT. And the higher T is, the higher up and to the right it is. So what we have is right here, this purple curve here is every possible for a given temperature, every possible PV. You might have for a given temperature, high pressure, low volume. You might have medium pressure, medium volume. You might have low pressure, high volume. But for a given temperature, let's just call it 100 Kelvin, uh, as long as it stays at that temperature, these are all the possible values for pressure and volume. Now, let's say we change to a different temperature, 200 Kelvin. Well, you're still going to have the same hyperbola shape, but it's going to be higher up and to the right from the one that's at 100 Kelvin. What I'm describing to you are curves called isotherms. Those curves show every possible point that pressure and volume can be for a given temperature. So let's just say that the purple, that that's 100 Kelvin, the blue is 200 Kelvin, then at 200 Kelvin, it could be this pressure volume, it could be this pressure and volume, but it's always going to be somewhere on that curve. So when we have what's called an isothermal process, pressure and volume are going to change. They're actually going to trade off with each other. One goes up, the other goes down. And on the graph, the system is going to stay on one of these isotherms. So for our piston, slowly increase volume while pressure decreases. So let's say we got where my pointer is. We're going to slowly increase volume, meaning going to the right. And if uh, temperature stays the same, it has to slide either up or down the isotherm. So it's going to make its way sliding down the isotherm as volume increases, pressure decreases. And let's actually look at the, the picture down here. This is what it looks like. We start at this initial point one, and we move to this initial point two. The work done on the gas is going to be this equation that I showed you previously, negative of the integral, P dV, and geometrically it's going to be the area under that curve, with, which I've shaded in in gray. Let's actually do the integral. Well, P dV, you know that P, because of the ideal gas law, is nRT over V, okay? 
Now we take the constants and put them out to the left, that's nRT, and we're left in the integral with dV over V volume. And that, the integral of that is the natural logarithm of V. So it becomes work is negative nRT times the natural log of V2 minus the natural log of V1. Consolidating it and simplifying it, this is the equation. So this is gonna be our important isothermal process equation that the work done on the system is, or on the gas is negative nRT times the natural log of V2 over V1. Now, if you're wondering where did he get V2 over V1, because over here it should have been natural log of V2 minus the natural log of V1, well, you can review um, rules of logarithms, one of the basic rules of logarithms, that if you have log of V2 minus log of V1, that's the same as log of V2 over V1. Now, another thing to consider, because temperature is constant, internal energy is constant. So internal energy, remember in the first law, that's what I wrote as U. The textbook actually writes it as E with a subscript INT, but they mean the same thing, internal energy. From chapter 17, actually from 17.1, we got that the average kinetic energy of the particles is three halves kT, that K is Boltzmann's constant. And so if that's the average kinetic energy, then the total internal energy is that average times the number of particles. So let's, to get the total energy, let's multiply by big N, the number of particles. So we get that the internal energy, U, is 3 halves nkt, which means that internal energy is proportional to T. And this goes back to when I first taught you the law of the first law of thermodynamics, delta U equals Q plus W. And I said that that change in internal energy, that also means there's a change in temperature. Well, in the case of isothermal processes, there is no change in temperature, which means delta U is zero. So zero equals Q plus W. And now I'm going to relate that to the work equation for isothermal processes. Q then is negative W, which then is nRT natural log V2 over V1. So in taking the negative of work, the negative sign that we had before right here where my pointer is has disappeared. So there it is again at the top of the screen, Q equals nRT natural log of V2 over V1. In an isothermal expansion, the gas gets bigger, but the temperature stays the same. Q must be greater than zero. By this equation, if it expands and temperature remains the same, heat has to flow into it. So heat flows in, and temperature stays the same. That sounds kind of weird until you have an understanding of the first law of thermodynamics, that we can actually add heat to a system, but its temperature doesn't change. Well, it's allowed to do that if it's allowed to expand as well. If work is done by the gas, it must absorb an equal amount of heat to keep constant temperature. So there we have a picture here. Um, it increases in volume, heat flows in, temperature stays the same. For compression, work is done on the gas. It must lose an equal amount of heat. And so if it gets compressed and we expect temperatures to stay the same, it has to lose heat. Let's look at problem number 38 at the back of chapter 18. Problem number 38 says a 0.25 mole sample of an ideal gas initially occupies 3.5 liters. If it takes 61 joules of work to compress the gas isothermally to 3 liters, what is the temperature? So we write down, as always, the given information. N is 0.25 moles. V1 is 3.5 liters. V2 is 3 liters. Work is plus 61 joules. The question is asking, what is the temperature? So let's do it. We take our thermo, I'm sorry, our isothermal process equation that involves work and temperature and volume. There it is. And we're going to solve it for T. 
remembering that R is the universal gas constant, 8.314 joules per Kelvin mole. So we solve for T, we get negative W over NR natural log of V2 over V1, plug those numbers in, we get 190 Kelvin. Well, the first type of process I taught you about is isothermal. Let's look at another type. This is called isochoric or isovolumetric. It goes by both names. Isochoric is preferred by some because it's easier to say, but isovolumetric is preferred by some because it, uh, it's more obvious what it's talking about, equal volumes. So I'll call them both isochoric or isovolumetric. The book, yes, the book calls it a constant volume process, also called isometric, isochoric, or isovolumic. Well, I have a fourth choice, isovolumetric. So it goes by all those names, constant volume. So you can consider a rigid closed container, like a can of of spray, the can of bug spray, something like that. You have so many of these cans uh, that you buy at the at the store, and they say, do not incinerate, do not expose to temperatures above 120 degrees. Warning, contents are under pressure. All right, there's a reason for that warning. So let's look at this. Isochoric, volume stays the same, means if we look at the PV diagram, it's going to go straight up, volume stays the same, but pressure goes up. Now that's for a, an isochoric increase in pressure. We could also have an isochoric decrease in pressure and uh, the arrow goes down. And notice what it does. If it's going up in pressure and it stays the same volume, it also goes up to a higher isotherm. So a higher temperature for a, for a fixed volume, higher temperature means higher pressure. Remember that work is the area under the curve. There's a negative sign there, but uh, that's not going to be relevant here. Work is area under the curve, and you look at the picture, and you see there is no area under that curve. It's zero. So volume stays the same. There is no work done. Also, mathematically, it comes out. You take the integral of that, and it comes out to be zero. Well, if work equals zero, then our first law of thermodynamics becomes delta U equals Q plus W. But W is zero, so delta U equals Q, which means if you add heat, the, the temperature will go up. Now there's my drawing, my can of bug spray or whatever, contents under pressure. So you be careful of that. If you do add heat, you or if the temperature of it goes up, then pressure will go up, and it can go up enough to exceed the what the canister can hold. And here down below, you see a picture of a can of spray that has exploded, and it makes a huge mess. And it can be very dangerous as well if people are in the way, but at the very least, it will make a huge mess. The third type of process is an isobaric process. We've talked about isothermal, where temperature stays the same. We've talked about isochoric, where volume stays the same. So we've got isobaric, which is where pressure stays the same. Look at the curve as I've drawn it. It could be going to the left or to the right. Uh, going to the right from left to right would be an increase in volume. Going from right to left will be a decrease in volume, but pressure stays the same. Now, what I haven't drawn is, I'm going to go ahead and draw these right now, some isotherms. So let me, to the best of my ability, draw, uh, oh, I missed it. Oh, well, there's one isotherm. I can do better than that. Good enough. There's one isotherm. And here's another isotherm, a higher isotherm. Okay, close enough. And what you can see is that it's changing temperature. If it goes from left to right, an increase in volume, temperature does increase. It's going to a higher isotherm. If it's going from right to left, it's going to a lower isotherm, so temperature decreases. Let's think about the work. Well, work, remember, is area under the curve, and that's easy here. It's a rectangle. And so you can see work is 
uh, let's think about the area of this rectangle. The height is the pressure. The length of the rectangle is the change in volume. So work is pressure times delta V. But remember, there's also the negative sign in there because if the thing expands, then negative work is being done on it. If the, the system contracts, then positive work is being done on it. So it's opposite what's happening to the change in volume. So work is the negative of P delta V. Quick example, let's say we have a gas that is a constant. So there's isobaric, constant pressure, five times 10 to the fifth pascals. That's about five atmospheres. It expands from six cubic meters to 10 cubic meters. What is the work done? So work equals negative P delta V. And these are all MKS units. That's nice and convenient. So negative of five times 10 to the fifth pascals times 10 minus six cubic meters. And we get negative two times 10 to the six joules. It's an expansion. So we expected work to be negative because the gas is doing work on its environment. So work being done on the gas is negative. And how is the temperature affected? Well, let's think about the isotherms. So if it went from left to right, 0.1 to 0.2, it went to a higher isotherm, which means in the process, temperature increased. So you can see the usefulness of a PV diagram in this question right here. We, we have the equation and we can solve W equals negative P delta V, but to ask, to think about the question, how is temperature affected? Well, I haven't employed any formula for this. It's something that we can visually inspect the PV diagram and see it goes to a higher isotherm. So without doing any calculations, we can just see that that's the effect, increased temperature. The fourth type of process is called an adiabatic process. The book covers this in more mathematical detail and description. I will only give it to you conceptually, and if you take a higher level thermodynamics course, you will get more into adiabatic processes. But an adiabatic process is just one in which there is no heat flow. And in order to have no heat flow, it's got to be very quick and very insulated. So we can think about this gas, whether it's compressing or expanding. And if it's done slowly, and it's a non-insulated container, then heat will flow out or it will flow in depending on what we're doing with it. But if it's an insulated container and it's done very quickly, so there's no time for heat to flow, then we can consider it as an adiabatic process. So you can see my picture, my piston here. And I've uh, drawn the piston going down. So work is being done on the gas, work is positive, and internal energy will go up in the process. Well, here we have the first law of thermodynamics. Internal energy change is Q plus W, but for an adiabatic process, Q is zero. So the change in internal energy is equal to the work done. If we do 100 joules of work on it, then internal energy will go up by 100 joules and that means temperature will go up. Now, if we do this slowly, then we do work on it, temperature might go up, but also heat is allowed to flow out. But adiabatically, no heat flows out, temperature goes up. In general, we can say if work is positive, temperature increases. If work is negative, temperature decreases. Now, it's not always true to say if it compresses. It's true to say if the gas compresses, then temperature increases. But there are other systems that you can do positive work and you're not doing a compression. For example, if you take a spring or a rubber band, some kind of elastic, you can do work on it by stretching it. In that case, it gets bigger. We could say it's expanding. But you have to think not in terms of is it expanding or contracting, but rather, is work being done on it or, or not? Or is negative work being done? Well, if you take an elastic and you stretch it out, then work is positive. So in that case, if you do it quickly enough, temperature will increase. If with our elastic, we have it stretched out and we release it, we let it go back to equilibrium, 
work on it is negative and temperature will decrease. Well, let's think back to our gas. What happens to pressure? Think about the ideal gas law. PV equals NRT, which means pressure is NRT over V. And so So since pressure is related to what's going on with the temperature, what's going on with the volume, then pressure must change. Or otherwise, volume must go down while T goes up, or V goes up while T goes down. Okay, but let's look at this PV diagram right here. Let's look at a compression of the gas, and let's look at volume going down, temperature going up. So this is what an adiabatic process looks like. It goes from the purple isotherm to the, the blue isotherm. And volume goes down, temperature goes up, so it's skipping, it's jumping up to the isotherm. And you can then conclude pressure goes up. All right. Let's put a lot of these concepts together. Let's uh, look at this example. An ideal gas is slowly compressed, constant pressure of two atmospheres from 10 liters to two liters. Heat is added, holding volume constant, and pressure and temperature rise until temperature reaches its original value. Calculate A, the total work done by the gas, and B, the total heat flow into the gas. Let's draw a PV diagram. You can see my diagram down below right here. So I'm going to read through the problem again and draw the PV diagram. It says an ideal gas is slowly compressed. So constant pressure. And look what I've drawn here. This is this branch number one right here. Slowly compressed, so we know it's going to go from right to left. It's at a pressure of two atmospheres. There, I've drawn that on the vertical axis. And it goes from 10 liters to 2 liters. So that's our first step. Second step, heat is added, holding V constant, so it's going to go vertical because the volume is constant. Pressure and temperature rise, okay, so it's going up, until temperature reaches the original value. So this is where the isotherm is useful. How high do I draw it? When do I stop drawing it? Well, I've got this isotherm here, and I draw it, I keep drawing until it hits that isotherm. So we have step one and step two. Calculate the total work done by the gas and the total heat flow into the gas. Well, the work done by the gas, that's only going to apply in step one because work is zero for step two, but we need to find out what it is on step one. And notice the question is asking the total work done not on the gas, but by the gas. So we're actually looking for the negative of W. Well, let's see what happens. We say that work in step one is negative P delta V. Here we have the negative P times delta V, but we need MKS units, so two atmospheres, we're gonna to have to convert that 1.013 times 10 to the fifth pascals over atmospheres. And then we need, it was 10 liters to two liters. So let's do our conversion. Two liters is the final, and that's two times 10 to the negative three cubic meters minus 10 times 10 to the negative 3, and what we end up with is plus 1621 joules. Step 2 is isovolumetric, so work is 0, which means the sum of the works in those two steps is plus 1621 joules, but the question asked what is the work done by the gas, so we'll say negative 1621 joules. Now, the other question is, what is the total heat flow into the gas? We can't just look at the picture for this. We're going to have to do a little bit of a calculation, not too much, but we recognize that overall the temperature is unchanged. So yes, the temperature changed in step one, and yes, it changed in step two, but the entire process together, temperature remains unchanged. So we'll say delta U equals zero for the entire process, which means first law of thermodynamics says delta U equals Q plus W, which means if temperature didn't change, zero equals Q plus W. So the heat flow, Q, is the opposite of W, which means it's the opposite of 1621 joules, so negative 1621 joules. And so we can conclude that heat flows out from the gas because heat is negative.
but the answer to the question, the question has how much heat flows into the gas is actually negative 1621 joules. Here's an application in biology, human metabolism. The first law of thermodynamics, apply, of thermodynamics applies to much more than just canisters of gas. It applies to everything. And let's apply this to the human body. So we have delta U equals Q plus W. Now the body maintains a constant temperature. There's a lot of cellular function going on in these processes that maintain constant temperature uh, about uh, 98 degrees Fahrenheit, 37 degrees Celsius, or about 310 Kelvin. And so if our body maintains a constant temperature, the first law of thermodynamics becomes U equals Q plus W. Now the body is always doing work. The, the, we can think of our body as the system, always doing positive work. And, uh, you know, there's the, um, even if we're not thinking about we're lifting things, we're running, we're walking. Well, at the, at the internal level, cellularly, there is work being done by our cells, by our organs. Positive work is being done by the body, which means for purposes of the first law of thermodynamics, work done to the body or on the body is negative. So our first law of thermodynamics becomes from 0 equals Q plus W, we have Q equals negative W, and that's got to be greater than 0, because if work done on the body is negative, then the negative of work is going to be positive, which means Q e must be greater than 0 for uh, temperature to maintain constant, or constant temperature to be maintained. So as it says here, to maintain constant temperature, there must be heat added to the body. But uh, normally, heat leaves the body. And so you think our body is 37 degrees Celsius, room temperature typically 21 degrees Celsius, and that leads to a natural process of heat leaving the body. So there's this problem here in that in order to maintain constant temperature and to make up for the work that our body does, heat needs to be added. But heat will tend to leave our body because we tend to live in environments that are cooler than our bodies. So we need a source of heat for our body. We need a source of energy, and that's where food comes in. So the food that we eat, our body metabolizes it. It turns it into the energy uh, that we need to add that uh, to that internal energy of the body. Now we measure food calories, one calorie, and notice I've written that with a capital C, is 4,184 joules. So a quick example, when running, when we do exercise, we burn calories. So we need calories to, uh, to make our bodies work, to do the work that we want to do. But we also burn calories when we do things. Uh, even when you're sleeping, the body burns, I think, about on average, about 40 calories per hour. When exercising, so I use the example of running, Let's say we run a mile in nine minutes. And so that means we're burning 120 calories, typical human body running at that pace, about 120 calories, 120 calories per nine minutes. So that's in watts, but let's, uh, or that's uh, in power, but let's convert that to watts. So I've converted one minute over 60 seconds. I've converted calories to joules, 4184 joules per calorie, and that's 930 watts. So while when running a nine minute mile, a typical uh, power expenditure is about 900 some watts. Here is the summary of mathematical concepts in this chapter. These are in the back of the chapter in your book. In general, the work done by a system is related to the changes in pressure and volume. So we have this equation right here. Work is negative of the integral of PdV. We talked about the different types of ideal gas processes. The first type was isothermal. And the first law of thermodynamics becomes Q equals negative W. And the important equation to use is W equals negative NRT times the natural log of V2 over V1. And in that process, when it's isothermal, PV equals constant. 
We also had constant volume or isovolumetric where, so volume is constant, which means it's a vertical line on the PV diagram. Area under the curve is zero, so work done is zero. And we have isobaric, where pressure stays constant. It makes a rectangle. And so the work done is the area of that rectangle, pressure times change in volume. But remember, it's got to be negative, so we'll slip a negative sign in there. And in the process, you can see it changes from one isotherm to the next. So in an isobaric process, the temperature will either go up or down. And that is the end of chapter 18. Have a great day.